start our fourth day of the school. Um, I hope people had good time canoeing yesterday, right? I'm getting the right one. And um, that was a lot of fun. Um, I don't have any super special announcements for today. Let's maybe just get started slowly. We are pleased to have Elisa Ferreira. Much like Emily Ishida yesterday, Elisa um, crossed seas and the mountain ranges to come here. She is coming from Institute for Physics and Mathematics of the Universe in Japan. And she's going to talk about dark matter. Elisa, off to you. Thank you. Not super high, but can you hear me? Okay, good. All right, good morning. I hope you're all alive after the canoeing trip. I don't know how it went, but I heard someone tip the canoe. So <laughs> I hope you're alive, whoever you are. So nice to meet you all. My name is Elisa, for those who don't know me. And like Gragan said, I'm a professor uh, in Japan at the Kavli Institute for the Physics and Mathematics of the Universe, the fancy name, but also at the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. And today, Dragon asked me to talk about dark matter. Uh, we're going to have two dark matter classes, so mine and also Vera's. Uh, and I think it's a very good time to start talking about dark matter now in the last two days. So until now, you heard a lot about dark matter. So you use dark matter for everything. Uh, so we saw with Gil that the CMB gives us that we need to have a non-baryonic component, an extra component in the universe, and you can measure quite well the abundance of this component. So you also saw with Gary that lenses measure the total mass of our universe, the total mass that we have, is that includes also a non-baryonic, no, no visible, no ordinary mass, which is the dark matter mass, and it's more mass than the visible one. Uh, Lehman also shows some simulations that also take into account that you had dark matter, so you have to assume a dark matter and uh, run those simulations. And Frank, of course, talked a lot about dark matter. What is the distribution of dark matter in halos on small scales and how this affects the big scales and how hypotheses maybe of the dark matter can affect whatever, how you interpret your observations. So you use dark matter a lot. And there's hypotheses that have been made during all of those talks about the nature of dark matter, not the nature, but the properties of dark matter. And until now we use the ordinary or hypothesis for dark matter, but there's small changes that can, we can apply to dark matter that are still allowed by observations that would actually have observational consequences. So for this talk, uh, I want to discuss then the dark matter. So what are the properties what did we assume in all of the lectures we had before the week, uh, in the days before today, and how we got to those properties and how those properties can be changed and maybe change some of the conclusions of the things we saw in the first three days of this school. So I think this is a perfect time for us to start talking about dark matter, its properties, how we get them from observations, and what are the different types of models or mechanisms that we can have for dark matter. So uh, this is the plan for my talk. So I'll have two lectures and also Vera will have two lectures. So in those roughly four hours or five hours of dark matter, uh, we want to give you a general idea of how dark matter, what dark matter can be, what are the properties of dark matter and what is the landscape of dark matter models and how this will affect um, cosmological observations or how we can infer those properties from observations. So the plan for my lectures are first in lecture one, I want to talk about evidences for dark matter and also dark matter model building until we go to the second lecture where we talk about dark matter models and we explore a few of the models that are the main models for dark matter. So in lecture one, so today we're going to talk about, first we're going to talk about the evidence for dark matter. So the thing is that we talk about dark matter like it's something we know exactly what it is, right? Dark matter, obviously, we know it's there, we know more or less how it behaves, but the fact is that we never measure dark matter, we never detected dark matter. We detect its gravitational influence in astrophysics and cosmology. So, 
we infer from observations the properties of dark matter and then try to build models uh, that describe those properties. So the evidences are very important. This might sound very basic. Oh, we all know the evidences for dark matter. But all the models we build, we are inferring something from each of those evidences. And this step of like seeing the evidence and inferring then a property or a model, it is something that I think we all take for granted, but is not so easy or so general. So some of the main topics in dark matter nowadays are people trying to reinterpret the evidences for dark matter. So I think it's important to show you what are the evidences so you can see how we extract properties from there. So you can judge yourself or build your own dark matter model or judge if the properties and hypotheses we made are good or not. So that's why I'm going to start with the evidence for dark matter. Then we go for dark matter model building. Uh, which is basically what each of those observations we have nowadays tell us about the properties of dark matter. So although we don't know what dark matter is, we know quite well the properties of dark matter. Dark matter is one of the most well-measured problems in physics that we don't know what it is. So we measure quite well. We have many observations. We know the properties a lot, uh, but we still don't know what it is. And then we're going to build uh, what are the prerequisites for a dark matter model? We're then going to go to the mass bounds. So if I'm going to build a dark matter model, what are the masses that I am allowed to have this dark matter model, given the observations we have? And then I'm going to show you today the landscape of models uh, of dark matter uh, that we were very creative to construct. So like Frank did in the first day, I just want to say that, first of all, it's impossible to talk about the entire dark matter field in two hours. Also, dark matter can be taught very particle physics-like or very cosmology-like. or So there's many ways of teaching dark matter. So there won't be two dark matter lectures that you're going to see that are going to be the same <laughs> because it's really huge. So it can, the person can choose how to go. So my vision is going to be kind of biased. So I'm a cosmologist. So I'm also going to focus more on the cosmology side. Uh, yeah, and I'll focus on giving a general review of dark matter. And again, it might seem basic, but I urge you not to take those hypotheses or the interpretations that people have of the data like set on stone. So we're still trying to understand what dark matter is. And like I said, models nowadays usually go beyond what were the hypothesis before. Um, and also this is a field that is changing quite fast. So if it was maybe five to 10 years ago when I was sitting there, this will be evidences, thermal dark matter, WIMPs done. And this is not how it is anymore. So the landscape changed a lot in the past few years. So I wanna give an idea of this modern view of dark matter, again, quite biased. So there's a lot of literature that you can read. So here I put the main textbooks. So I'd say the main textbooks, they will give you a general view of dark matter. And the newest ones like dragons, they really give a, a fresh view, like I said, fresh view from uh, what we think about dark matter is nowadays. But also reviews. And I'll be going to be citing reviews throughout the talk so you can um, see which review for each model or mechanism you want to check. Right, so I think now we're ready to start today's lecture. So, of course, everything we see in our uh, observations with, uh, I don't know, satellites, telescopes, is billions and billions of galaxies or the radiation from CMB. Um, but those galaxies and gas that we see or radiation is only a fraction of all the gravitational force or of all the gravitational potential that we have in our universe. Uh, these galaxies and gas, they actually trace this underlying gravitational potential that is much, much stronger than anything that we see in our universe. And we interpret this as the dark matter distribution. So, 
as we know, there is a huge amount of evidence for the existence of dark matter. And this evidence comes from different scales. So here we're talking about CMB and large scale structures, really, really large scales, passing by intermediate scales like clusters to really small scales on galaxies, that are even subgalactic. And nowadays models of dark matter, even on solar system scale. And this huge amount of evidence uh, tells us that there is dark matter in the universe, or better, tell us that there's something, something more than we thought. So we usually say, oh, this is evidence for dark matter, but we actually don't know. This is the interpretation we give now. This is the paradigm. This is what explains everything much better than anything else. But all that this evidence, all these observations gives us is evidence that there's something more something missing from the ordinary, from the variance that we know in the universe. And then the interpretation of those results give us then dark matter. I'm going to start with the most famous maybe, or the one of the pioneer on the first observations of dark matter with the galaxy rotation curves. So what I'm showing you here is an elliptical galaxy. And you can see the stars rotating in this elliptical galaxy. And here on the, your right side, I show you the rotation without dark matter, and on the left, the rotation with dark matter. So even by eye, you can already see that things are very different with the presence of dark matter. So if I try to then uh, describe the circle of movement, so this is no relativistic physics, Newtonian physics, simple th physics, I can describe the rotation curve, which is, is this working? Okay. Which is the velocity uh, times the distance given by this here. So this is just Newtonian mechanics. There's nothing fancy. So the velocity of those stars depends on the mass that we have in this galaxy. And for each radius, I'm going to have a different velocity. Then you can plot the um, rotation curve. So rotation curve is just velocity times radius. And if you plot this without dark matter, you're going to see that in the regions that I have more, more stars, right, the more visible region, I'm going to have a bigger velocity. And then as I don't have stars too much in the, uh, towards the outskirts of the galaxy, the velocity is going to go down. If I'd have dark matter, this is different. So the velocity goes up and keeps constant because I have dark matter, I have matter, in the universe, uh, in the galaxy, even outside the, vis the visible part. So here, uh, and then people went and start measuring rotation curves, right, of galaxies. And then you can see here in those points. So here's observational data. So if I didn't have dark matter following this, uh, the circular motion for the velocity, uh, we would expect this type of rotation curve. But actually what we measure, it is this, so it goes towards, it keeps going, keeps a large velocity, even in the outskirts of the halo where we don't have a lot of visible matter, a lot of stars. And then you have to interpret this. You can interpret this in many different ways. The way we all interpret it, or most of us interpret it, is that there is a missing mass. So I'm probably not taking into account the real amount of mass of the galaxy. So if I take a little bit more mass into account, I can then fit perfectly um, this rotation curve, right? So if I assume Newtonian physics is correct, I add more mass to my problem, and then I fix the rotation curve. So this means that there is a huge amount of mass that is not visible, right? It's not ordinary. And then we call dark matter. So this gives you this view of the dark matter halo. So the dark matter halo is going to have here the disk, right? Where, where most of the visible stars, the gas, everything is surrounded by a dark matter halo. So I can measure its effect, right? Through the dynamics, but we cannot see. So this is the, the view that we have of the halo thanks to the rotation curves. Or this formula is wrong, right? So it's possible. We measure Newtonian physics quite well here. It might be that it doesn't work in galaxies, but we're going to talk about this 
hopefully in the end of this talk. The second evidence for the existence of dark matter is clusters of galaxies. So clusters are this, the largest gravitationally bound systems that we have. So those are hundreds and thousands of galaxies bounded together in this gravitationally bound system. Uh, and if I try to apply the Vero theorem here, again, Newtonian dynamics here, try to understand how do I keep all of this gas and galaxy bound in this huge system, it doesn't work because galaxies and gas are only around 10% of what is, clusters are made of. This hot gas, it's more than galaxies, it's 10%. But still, if I only get the velocities of those galaxies and the positions of those galaxies and use again the Vero theorem to try to understand, they cannot be bound together. It wouldn't work. So this tells us that I'm missing 90% of the matter of this cluster, which is going to be in the form of something that is, again, non-luminous. It doesn't interact with anything. So we call this dark matter. So this is a huge and very important evidence for the existence of dark matter. The other evidence is lensing. So as you guys have been learning, about lensing, I'm not going to talk about much about it. So lensing is going to be, uh, so whatever image that you have about your galaxy, I'm showing um, stroke lensing, this is going to be uh, lensed by a lens galaxy or a lens cluster that you have in the middle of the way. So lens is sensitive to, for example, strong lensing is very easy to see, is sensitive to the entire amount of matter that I have in that system. So what is going to be measuring is the total amount of matter, not the amount of visible matter. So lensing is capable then to measure, to tell us what is the total amount of matter, not only the amount of visible matter. Um, and we see that there's something missing, but I'm going to let leave this um, to another day. Uh, another big evidence for the existence of dark matter is clusters and lensing. So when you combine those two, and the famous example, an amazing example is the bullet cluster. So the bullet cluster, it is actually the aftermath of the merger of two clusters. So we are living in a perfect time that we can see the perfect aftermath after two clusters just cross each other and they are going away to either, uh, each of their paths. So this is the bullet cluster. So if I analyze in optical and in X-rays, so remember I told you clusters are 10% of hot gas. So there's a lot of gas. So if I'm measuring optical in an X-ray, I see that the distribution of matter, of this visible matter in the bullet cluster is shown in this pink region. So here in the pink region. So basically what happens is that gas, it's really hot, it's going to interact, there's a lot of pressure, it's going to interact. So when it's passing one to the other, it's going to be slowed down by the pressure of this hot gas. But then when I analyze the bullet cluster using lensing and I construct this mass contours, I actually see the blue picture here. So I see that there's a bunch of known visible matter, ordinary matter, that passed by each other, did not interact, and it is further away from the center. So from the mass contours, I see that actually most of the matter is shifted from this central region. So the visible matter is here on the central region, but from the lensing, I see that most matter is actually here on farther away. So what is the conclusion for that? that there is probably an amount of matter that we don't see, so it's not visible, and is non-interacting. So it, it was not slowed down when these two things uh, went across each other. Uh, so this is another indication of dark matter. So there's a lot of dark matter in those clusters, and when those two clusters merge, the dark matter just passed by each other, so it doesn't interact, while the visible matter interacted and slowed down and was only staying in the middle here. So the bullet cluster is really an amazing evidence for the existence of dark matter. Uh, here you see a video of it. So dark matter is in blue, 
visible matter, the gas mostly is in red. And you can see that's what, how we think the bullet cluster happened. So this is one of the evidence for dark matter. And different than the galaxy rotation curves, it seemed a little bit harder to explain this with maybe that formula was wrong, right? So dark matter seems to be a very good explanation. It explains both. Um, it would be kind of hard to explain this with just changing um, Newtonian physics. Um, and another evidence for dark matter is, of course, the large scale structure. And that's what you have been studying for the beginning of the week. And then I'm not going to talk too much about it. So basically, we see from CMB and large scale structure that there is an amount, a big amount of matter in the universe that is not the balance, right? So, um, and also Vera is going to talk a little bit about how do you get the amount of matter, the dark matter from uh, large scale structures. But large scale structure is one of the strongest, uh, strongest um, evidence for dark matter. Um, it's very precise measurement that there is a non baryonic component in our universe. So each of those evidence that I told you uh, tell us a little bit about the property of dark matter. So like you said, the bullet cluster, this passed by each other, it did not interact. So it tells you about, okay, this is probably collisionless or it doesn't interact really strongly. But each of those tell us a little bit about the properties of dark matter. So that's how we learn about the properties of dark matter, of what dark matter could be. Uh, we get each of those different uh, observations on different scales. And each of those are going to tell us a little bit about how this component, new component that we assumed, it's a new component to explain all of those behave. And the beautiful thing about dark matter is that with one explanation, having an extra component, I can actually explain things on galactic scales and large scale structure. So what do we know about dark matter? So having all of those observations on different scales, what could we gather? What could we learn about dark matter? So first of all, let's talk about the largest scales because those are where we have the most precise observations um, today. So we know that the large scales, so CMB, large scale structure, tell us that what is the paradigm for cosmology is the lambda CDM model. So in this model, dark matter is going to be around 26, 27 percent of what our universe is composed here, given by Planck, and is going to be described by a fluid, a cold dark matter fluid. And what does that mean? So the cold dark matter fluid, so the cold dark matter paradigm, that is what we get, the explanation we get for dark matter from the large scale structure is the following. So first, we're going to assume that dark matter is this perfect fluid. So I can totally describe it by the energy density and the pressure, and also an equation of state. Um, and this is going to be a fluid that is non-relativistic today. It's pressureless. So what does that mean? It means that it's going to cluster on all scales. So in the CMB, at least from the scales, we can see, we see that dark matter is clustering. Uh, so this gives us, in the perturbations, this gives us that uh, the equation of state is equal to zero. Um, so it has zero pressure and it has a zero or very small sound speed. So this means that dark matter not only is non-relativistic today, it clusters on all scales. So it's a pressureless, pressureless fluid. Uh, it also tells us that dark matter is dark. So basically it doesn't emit light. And that is kind of obvious because in all the observations we had, it was always the component that was there gravitationally. I could measure its gravitational potential. I could measure its gravitational influence, but I could not see either in optical, X-ray, or anything. And also, as we saw from, for example, the bullet cluster, it's collisionless. So it doesn't interact with itself or with the standard model particles, with baryons too much because it passed by much faster then the gas pass, for example, on the bullet cluster. And we know its abundance quite well. So this is the CDM, so the cold dark matter, which is the current paradigm for the, what we think dark matter is. And it's very successful paradigm, observationally. 
So it's very simple. Let's think like I'm saying that this is a perfect fluid with the equation of state equals to zero. So it's extremely simple. I'm not even talking about if it's a particle or not. I'm giving a very coarse grain description for dark matter. And it can explain the matter part spectrum. So this is the matter part spectrum. You guys saw this in the previous days. Here we have many measurements uh, of, the, of the power spectrum, matter part spectrum. And this CDM, this very simple paradigm, explains the power spectrum quite well on many different scales, like 10 to the minus k equals to 10 to the minus three to 10 megaparsec inverse. So this is large scales, this is small scales. So this explains the power spectrum in a huge amount of scales. And those scales are connected to the, the, the evolution of the universe. So it explains the universe quite well for its almost its entire evolution. So it is an incredible agreement with observations, although it's an incredible simple, uh, model or coarse grain description. This is not even a model, this is like a mechanism. Uh, so CDM is what we know from large scales. So on large scales, it has to behave very, very close to CDM. But what are the real properties that we extract from um, the observations? So you, you always hear about CDM and you always hear those words, collisionless, um, dark, it has no charge. But the fact is that that's not true. We have bounds for how much it cannot self-interact, bounds for the amount of charge it has, bounds for how warm or hot it can be. So let's see slowly what are the properties of dark matter. So first, like I said, cold and pressureless. How do we get this? So again, I showed you the matter power spectrum and said the matter, matter power spectrum is quite well described until something like 10 to 20 megaparsec inverse. So I can describe this well until I'll say, not small scales, but intermediary scales. I'm going to rewrite my power spectrum as a dimensionless power spectrum. So here's the dimensionless power spectrum, here's K. So this is the same power spectrum, but just written in a dimensionless content. And here, the highlighted region, it is exactly this um, 10 to 20 megaparsec inverse, which is my, how much I know, how much observations we have. So from here, the white region, it is where I can constrain the power spectrum quite well, as we can see here from observations. Uh, and this uh, gray area is where dark matter or the power spectrum is highly unconstrained yet. Um, and here I put a little bit of the um, sizes so you can understand which those scales correspond to. All right, so how do I interpret this K? How do I understand then? Uh, what does this K mean uh, in terms of um, how important those, those are for dark matter? So let's remember what happens uh, with the perturbations in our universe. So the perturbations uh, during inflation, they were created uh, and then they became bigger than Hubble radius where they froze and they remain frozen until they re-enter the Hubble radius. So the perturbations are going to re-enter the Hubble radius uh, when their physical size, A over K, is of the order uh, of the size of the Hubble radius. Here I'm writing everything on physical coordinates, right? Uh, but this translates into the K modes that are going to enter the horizon are going to be the K, the not horizon, Hubble radius, are going to be the Ks that are equals to AH. And this is what this blue curve is. This blue curve is AH. Sorry, is AH inverse. No, this is AH, sorry. Um, or you can write H over one plus Z. So this is the blue curve. Okay, so after uh, the perturbations enter the Hubble radius again, they start evolving again and they start growing. So they start clustering, growing, so they form the structures we see in the universe today. And then it's when they start contributing to the power spectrum. So when the modes start entering the, the, the Hubble radius, they start adding here to the power spectrum that we we have. Uh, and CDM perturbations grow like this inside the Hubble radius. 
So we know that as soon as they enter the Hubble radius, the, the dark matter perturbations, they are going to start growing. Uh, all right, so we can describe uh, then the observations. So here is my matterport spectrum again. I have observations until around 10 megaparsec inverse, and this is this gray region. So I'm going to write the same gray region here. So this is 10 megaparsec inverse. So this is the region where we don't have observations. So again, the white region is going to be the region where we have enough data to constrain the power spectrum. Uh, okay, so the modes that have this size here, 10 megaparsec more or less, those modes enter the Hubble radius around this redshift, around 10 to the 7. That's how you should read this plot. So uh, whatever corresponds here uh, to this curve is when the modes enter the Hubble radius and start contributing to the power spectrum. Uh, and those modes here in the white region, those are the modes that we know have to be described by this curve here, which is the CDM curve. Because it, again, looking here, it is in a perfect agreement, a very good agreement with observations. So all the modes with K smaller than 10 megaparsec, which I can read as all the modes that enter the Hubble radius before 10 to the, uh, after 10 to the seven, uh, have to be code, have to be described by CDM to describe this perfect power spectrum. So if I have a mode that is non-relativistic here, um, where I have a lot of measurement, this mode enters the Hubble radius then, but then is a relativistic mode. A relativistic mode is not going to grow. So what happens with the mode that is relativistic here, like before, uh, after 10 to the seven, is that it's going to suppress the power spectrum because this is a relativistic mode, right? It's not going to add to the growth. Everything that is here, all the modes that enter the horizon, the Hubble radius in this white region need to be code to explain the data. So this gives us a bound on, uh, on, when can I have, uh, when dark matter should be already cold or warm? So uh, for all the modes uh, that have uh, K equals to 10, they need to enter the horizon. They need to be cold by the redshift 10 to the seven. That's how you should read this. So uh, otherwise they're going to suppress the power spectrum. If the mode, uh, if the mode, um, and how do I interpret this? So if dark matter is in thermal equilibrium, so here I also plotted the temperature of, of the photons, right? So the photon temperature is going to be the photon temperature zero, which is the CMB, 2.5, 2.7 Kelvin, one plus Z. This is how temperature evolves. So here's redshift and you can relate to temperature. If this dark matter component, if this, um, Perturbation is in contact, in equilibrium, thermal equilibrium with the, uh, the baryon photon plasma. This is going to have the same temperature as the photon baryon plasma. So this tells us that uh, whatever dark matter candidate I have that is in contact with the photon baryon plasma needs to already be cold by 10 to the seven, uh, redshift 10 to the seven, which corresponds to a temperature of KV. And this is what we know as a warm dark matter bound. So dark matter has to be non-relativistic before 10 to the seven uh, to explain this cold dark matter spectrum. So modes that are inside the, the Hubble radius before 10 to the seven needs to be non-relativistic. And this puts a bound uh, on how cold dark matter is. So this means that today dark matter needs to be cold uh, or warm maximum. And if this dark matter was in thermal equilibrium, it has to have a mass. So, oh, sorry, this is smaller, uh, bigger, sorry, bigger than KV. So it has to be heavy. Um, oh yeah, so here I just put the, if you're curious about what those suppressions are here, 
those are just warm dark matter candidates with this mass. So this is four kV, so it's heavier than our bound. So this means that at 10 to the seven, redshift 10 to the seven, this was cold already. But if this is something like 100 eV, this was still warm when it enters the Hubble radius, so it's going to suppress the power spectrum. And this is not allowed by the data we have nowadays. So this also means that in all this gray region, I am allowed to suppress the power spectrum with the data we have nowadays. Of course, maybe in 10 years, this will be a very different picture, but you can create whatever dark matter model you want, thermal or not, uh, that suppresses the power spectrum in this gray region. So it's not that dark matter is cold and pressureless. It's actually that dark matter needs to be cold today. And for that to happen, it needs to be non-relativistic at redshift 10 to the 7. Because that's when the moles that we measure today uh, enter the Hubble radius. Is that clear? Yeah. Yeah. So the it can be warm, but it has to be bigger than kV. Like one, kV or one kV, roughly. If it follows cold, then like yeah. Like yeah. So this one is not allowed, right? Yeah, this is too this is too hot uh, when it enters. So it's too relativistic when it enters the Hubble radius. So it's going to cause a suppression of the power spectrum where we know it should not happen. Yeah. But if it's one, if it's two here, it really depends on details of the model and the calculation. Yeah, you could. Peter, how strong is the assumption of uh, the thermal equilibrium between dark matter and the mm -hmm. just by the gravity? Yeah, so here I'm not saying specifically which model is coupled, but here to have um, this type of dark matter and thermal equilibrium, uh, it had to be coupled somehow for some reason. So maybe it has a weak interaction or something. So I'm not saying models here, but it could be, yeah, it has to be something besides gravity. And I think Vera is going to talk about that. So I'm just going to say that when you hear, oh, CDM is dark matter, CDM, well, no, 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 we have bounds on how cold or how warm dark matter can be. And we have bounds, the pressure is here is basically about clustering. We have bounds. We know how much dark matter cluster, how dark matter cluster on uh, scales smaller than 10 megaparsec inverse. Okay. Right. So we all know dark matter is dark or transparent. Uh, so it doesn't interact uh, electromagnetically. So what does this mean? Um, just this one and we can go to the break. Uh, so let's assume that dark matter interact electromagnetically, or does it mean that it interacts with photons? So dark matter has a charge. Here I'm writing this charge as an epsilon E, so it's like a small charge. So first of all, obviously, this couldn't be too strong, right? Because from observations, we saw that dark matter is whatever is there gravitationally, I don't see. So it's obvious that it cannot have a very strong interaction with photons. Uh, also, imagine if this interacts electromagnetically, this would change the abundance of the elements that we have, right? So we have, the, when we create the elements that interact through the electromagnetic force, if I have an extra force there, this would change the abundance of the light elements that we have in our universe. So again, we know that uh, we cannot have a strong electromagnetic interaction. Uh, but how strong? Again. Uh, we're talking about bounds here. That's what is important for model building. So how strong can it be? Uh, and one of the strongest bounds that we have on how much uh, dark matter can interact with photons come actually again from the power spectrum, from the suppression of the power spectrum. So, right. So if I have a charged dark matter particle, this is going to uh, interact then with my standard model particles, even if the charge is small. So here I'm assuming that the charge is small. 
So assume that I have this charge, this small charge. This means that now the dark matter is coupled to the baryon photon fluid somehow, right? Even if it's a small charge, it is coupled to baryons, basically. And if it's coupled to baryons during recombination, this charge, if this charge is there for dark matter, it's its own property, so it's coupled all the time with the baryons. So if it's coupled, then the dark matter density fluctuations is going to be washed out due to radiation pressure. So as the baryons uh, that we saw from Gill's lecture, that they suffer silk damping during, uh, during recombination, if dark matter had an electric charge, it would also suffer this damping. So I will also have a suppression of the power spectrum here showing this ADM, which stands for atomic dark matter. So atomic dark matter is a model I'm going to talk more about tomorrow, but basically is a model that has charge, small charge. So this means that this would suppress the power spectrum at certain scales that depend on the size of this charge. So again, the size of this charge, the intensity of this interaction is going to tell me in which scale this is going to suppress. And we know we cannot suppress the power spectrum uh, for scales smaller than 10 megaparsec inverse. Uh, so just to quote a few bounds, so if you use this, uh, I cannot have suppression of power spectrum before recombination, uh, you can put a bound on how uh, the, the charge that uh, dark matter can have. And actually dark matter can have charge, but it has to be small. Dark matter can have at most milli charge. So again, what people told you about um, the CDM paradigm, which was cold, pressureless, dark, is actually, is how cold it is, how pressureless it is, it is, and how dark it is. It can have a milli charge um, charge. Yes. Uh, how can we distinguish between the damping of power spectrum with uh, due to silk damping and free streaming damping at small scales? Yeah, so you can actually compute that. So if you have, for example, a model um, like this ADM or something, you know exactly the type of scattering that this would have, like Compton scattering and everything. And you can add this to the ones that you already have for baryons. So you're going to compute that on top of it. So you know how much you can suppress by having this type of diagrams, this type of Compton scattering or something. So this is how you can distinguish because you're going to do on top of whatever variants do. Yep. And then I had a clarification question about, um, so does the, uh, are we constraining the net charge of dark matter or are we just uh, constraining like a charge per particle? Um, this is a charge per particle. Okay. Yeah, this would be like, I have dark matter is a particle. I didn't say it's a particle until now, but let's assume it's a particle. And this particle has this charge. So it carries this number, which is electromagnetic charge. And it is this epsilon E here, where E is the electron charge. Yeah, so that's what I'm assuming for this calculation. But of course, depends on the model. Depending on the model, you might have a model that it is the global charge or something like that. But for this calculation, I assume this, but the bound is the same. It doesn't matter where this charge comes from. This can, on top of all the silk damping that I have from baryons, I cannot have silk damping from dark matter, unless a little, just a little bit coming from milli charge. Stop. So I see you in 10 minutes. Hi. My name is Alana. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Oh, I, I, this is amazing. I want to ask you.
Okay, so let's continue. We had some really good questions. Uh, so let me just say some things that came up in the questions. So those bounds here on the charge of dark matter, I'm assuming that dark matter is a particle and there's bounds on the mass for dark matter being a particle or not. Uh, and we're going to talk about this, but this is for particle dark matter. Another question we had is about nonlinear. So Frank talked about nonlinear uh, scales, how hard it is to really describe them. So check here this line. So here is where nonlinear scales enter. Uh, this seems too much, but until the place we have measurements here, which is Lyman alpha, uh, here, Lyman alpha ish, this is mildly nonlinear. So we kind of know or we think we know, I don't know how to describe those. So I said oh, a big challenge for dark matter is that I don't know the power spectrum here. So does this mean that if tomorrow I come and I measure how dark matter clusters inside galaxies or subgalactic scales, can I get this power spectrum? Hard, it's very hard. How do I compute the subgalactic power spectrum? Uh, how do I get a dark matter model, evolve it, and get the power spectrum in those nonlinear scales? So this is a big challenge for the community. So it's not that we don't, not only that we don't, we still don't have observations in those small scales, but it's also that we need to learn how to construct this power spectrum, this nonlinear power spectrum. And many people are advancing a lot. Even Gil has a way of constructing the subgalactic power spectrum. So this is a big challenge for for us in the next few years, but it's a challenge that we're going to make it. So this is something that in the five or 10 years, we're going to have enough data to start playing with this quite well. Okay, so we talked about charge. Uh, we talked about interacting electromagnetically, and we saw that it has to interact maximally millicharge. But what about all their interactions, right? So we have four forces um, in nature, uh, can dark matter interact through any of them? So can dark matter interact through the weak or strong forces? So first the strong force. So the strong force, uh, the limitary particles that interact with the strong force are the quarks and they interact through the strong force by exchanging gluons. And so if you guys remember here, this is the standard model picture. So here are the quarks and the gluon. Uh, and the quarks, not only uh, they, they, they carry also electric charge. So not only they exchange color, which is the strong force uh, charge, but they also carry electric charge. So dark matter cannot interact through the strong force or has bounds, kind of the millicharge bound, uh, some, tr some translation of this bound uh, to, uh, to dark matter to have um, interactions, okay? So strong force also very limited. Uh, if dark matter can interact through this force. But there's nothing uh, that doesn't allow dark matter to interact through the weak force. Of course, it has to be small. Otherwise, this is going to change, again, the abundance of the light elements that we have in the universe. So dark matter can have a weak force that is not too strong. So another thing we say about uh, CDM is that it's collisionless. So what does this mean? Or what is the bound on how collision, how much self-interaction dark matter can have? So what self-interaction means? It means that dark matter interacts with itself. So here very pictorially showed in this diagram. So I mean like, can I have a model where dark matter interacts gravitationally and with itself? So every time a particle dark matter sees another particle dark matter is going to interact somehow. Uh, and if I assume that dark matter interacts with itself, this can lead to a lot of changes and a lot of observational signatures. For example, it changes, of course, the power spectrum, but it's going to change the shape of the halo. So Frank said that the halo follows an NFW profile. If you have self-interactions, this will be very different because now I have another interaction to carry energy and momentum. So for example, in the halo, if I have self-interaction, this is going to allow this energy and momentum to flow from the inner and outer parts of the halo. Uh, and this is going to change the profile of the halo a lot. Uh, but this is going to change many other things. Also the distribution of dark matter, 
uh, the how the structures form, uh, and how do we measure self interaction? So many people here are not particle physicists. Uh, so just uh, really quickly remember uh, what it is uh, a cross section. So a cross section is basically measuring the rate. So if I have, for example, dark matter interacting with dark matter, and I want to calculate what is the rate of this uh, interaction, this is going to be given by the cross section, the number density, and the velocity. And then I can rewrite this as this thing here, which we call the dark matter, dark matter cross section per unity of dark matter mass um, times this thing. And this is connected to the probability of dark matter to scatter. You see here, the probability of dark matter to scatter has here the cross section. So when I give you the cross section of something, this is linked to the probability of this scattering process to happen. So when people talk about cross sections, you also always have to remember that this is what we have in mind, the probability of this scattering happening. And usually for dark matter, we quote the velocity dependent cross section, which is the simplest one. So uh, it doesn't depend does it doesn't depend on the velocity of this scattering, but of course, you could assume that it is velocity dependent, and there's no reason not to assume that. Uh, right. So, like I said, if I have a self interaction, uh, it can change many things in cosmology and astrophysics. So we can use many different types of observations like X-ray, large-scale structure, rotation curves of galaxies, many things to try to constrain if dark matter has uh, self-interaction or not. Um, uh, and again, the better power spectrum is what gives us probably one of the strongest bounds on self-interaction. Let's assume again, the atomic dark matter, which is a very good example because it has many interactions. Uh, so if I have this self-interaction uh, happening on dark matter, uh, the presence of this self-interaction is going to lead to um, these dark acoustic oscillations. So what does this mean? This means that, uh, so dark matter now is going to interact with itself. So when you're having the baryon acoustic oscillations, dark matter is also going to follow that uh, very strongly. And here we're representing this uh, for small scales, but basically that is what will happen. And this puts a strong bound on, on the self-interaction of dark matter, but still the strongest bounds come from uh, mergers of galaxies and strong lensing on the self-interaction. Because again, remember the bullet cluster, if it had self-interaction, dark matter would be in that center together with the bionic matter. And this gives this type of cross-sections. If this cross-section was one centimeter square per gram, this would change a lot, all of this. Um, so usually when we want to test how much it would change the distribution of the dark matter and everything, we put one here, one would change a lot but it's much smaller than one. Uh, but this is for the velocity independent. Uh, of course, if you put velocity dependence, this will change this bounds. So again, it's not that dark matter is collisionless. Dark matter can have a self-interaction, but it has to follow some bounds depending on if this self-interaction is in one type or another that leads to cross-sections that are velocity dependent or not. Okay, so these are the properties that we can take from observations, right? But as we have been talking until now, we have measurements, good measurements, really precise measurements until around 10 megaparsec inverse. So we know it has to respect this CDM um, description on large scales. But on, but on small scales, the behavior of dark matter is much less constrained. So for example, if after 10 megaparsec, it will go to one of those lines, we don't know how to constrain this well. We have measurements, of course, of galaxies and small structures, but those are not precise enough to tell us much about dark matter. And that's why we can have warm dark matter, mini charged dark matter, self-interacting dark matter. We can have many different dark matter models that are going to start changing the power spectrum after the scales 
uh, are measured from the from the large scale structure. More than that, there's also some small scale curiosities that we see in our universe that tells us that maybe dark matter doesn't behave quite like CDM. So it has to be very close to CDM on large scales, okay? So again, remember the power spectrum, that's very precise measurement. So on large scales, it has to be very close to lambda CDM, to CDM with those bounds that I just talked about. But on small scales, scales smaller than, than uh, the ones that we have the large scale measurements. So K is bigger than 10. Uh, dark matter has a lot of freedom to behave differently. And there's some small scale curiosities, problems, depending on who you ask, if they consider this a problem, a challenge or nothing. So some people don't even think this exists, but I'm going to say here and what they are. Uh, so those are discrepancies that we see between simulations of CDM and observations. So when we do, for example, a CDM simulation, uh, the profile that I get for galaxies, for the dark matter in galaxies, and again, profile, when I say profile, all I'm saying is the density times the radius. So how the density changes with the radius. So when I do simulations, I get this NFW profile, right? And NFW profile has something really interesting. For small radius, this diverges. So this is what we call a cusp. So this tells us that as you go to interior of galaxies more and more, the, den the density grows and grows and grows. And this is what we get from simulations of CDM. However, when we go to galaxies, especially dwarf galaxies, we actually see that the density grows, but then when we get to the center, it forms what we call a core. So it goes towards a, um, uh, constant density, like shown here. So this is what we call the cusp core problem. So dark matter, uh, to explain those galaxies, could not have an NFW profile, which is the profile we have from CDM. There's also other types of uh, small scale challenges. For example, the missing satellites problem, which is something many people might have heard, which is an incompatibility between the number of satellite galaxies that we see uh, and the ones that we predict. So many people think, and I think this is maybe the consensus now that this is problem is solved. So the problem is that we could not see those satellites and now we actually have too many. But I'm not saying everybody agrees with that. I would say that, so this missing satellites problem shouldn't be something very big. But the one that I like the most, the small scale challenge, are the regularity and diversity of rotation curves. So though galaxies are very diverse, so we see galaxies in all shapes and sizes uh, in, throughout the universe in different environments, they are extremely regular. And those are written as skating relations. So for example, the most famous one is baryonic tully fischer relation, which is this remarkably tight scaling relation between the baryonic mass of these galaxies and the circular velocity. Here we write as the final velocity. So each point here is a different galaxy. And all of those galaxies, they have completely different amount of baryons, completely different amount of dark matter. You have galaxies here that almost don't have baryons. You have galaxies here that have very little dark matter, but they all agree quite well. And this spread is so tight that it's smaller than the air bars of those galaxies. Again, galaxies of all shapes and sizes in our universe with different amounts of baryonic contents or dark matter contents agree quite well uh, in this relation. And this relation actually is not the relation that we would expect from lambda CDM. So this is a big problem that we don't know how to solve. We don't know the, the answer to it. But again, one thing should be said by the small scale problems. That's why I didn't want to call small scale problems, but challenges. Those are uh, incompatibilities between simulations of CDM alone and observations. And we know that our universe has variants, right? So one solution is, of course, we need simulations with variants, right? Because feedbacks, we know feedback can create cores. Uh, feedback can take out matter of, uh, uh, of our galaxies and solve many of those problems. So until we have simulations 
with variants included, and all of them agree because the problem now is that we cannot include variants as like the real thing. We have to parameterize the, how variants behave in these simulations, and each simulation does in a different way. They quite don't agree on what they predict. Maybe they agree in general, but but you can see a lot of difference in them. So it's an open question. You can modify dark matter, right? You can say, okay, maybe it's warm dark matter. You have a suppression of the power spectrum. And then this explains why you don't have the satellites. Or you can have self-interacting dark matter. You have a core now in the center of galaxies and this solves. Or some people say it's mond, but that is for another day. Yeah. So, so okay. So, that's why we have this freedom on dark matter. So it's not that it's CDM. It's CDM, it's very close to CDM. It doesn't have to be exactly CDM. It has bounds on large scales, but on small scales, I can play around. I can have a warm dark matter that suppresses the power spectrum. I can have a self-interacting dark matter that produces cores in my galaxies. I can have a merely charged dark matter that is going to change the observations a lot. So, but what is dark matter? So we're talking about properties and we know a lot of properties. So I don't want you to leave here with the impression that, oh, okay, we don't know nothing about dark matter. Dark matter is one of the most well measured problems in physics, but also the hardest one because we don't know what it is. What is its nature? What is its microphysics? When I say microphysics, when I say nature, it's like, what is made of? Is it a particle? Is it a black hole? what it is, right? Or what is the mechanism, like general mechanism? So how can we build a dark matter model? And here, again, let's just put again what we know about dark matter. So we have to build a dark matter model around this, right? And again, we said that it needs to be today cold or warm. If it is a thermal candidate, so if it was in, in thermal equilibrium with the universe, it has to have a mass bigger than KV, or it has to already be produced cold in the universe, and it was never in causal contact, uh, and never in equilibrium with our uh, photon barium plasma. So it has to be produced non-thermally. And we have dark matter candidates like that. So that's the first requ prerequisite. It has to have a small pressure. And when I say pressure, I'm basically saying how much it clusters and in which scales it clusters. And we know that it clusters like this pressureless fluid on large scales, right? So these scales, the white here, and on small scales is still highly unconstrained. So we have a lot of freedom to know how dark matter cluster on small scales. I changed dark and collisionless here for it is non-interacting or weakly interacting with itself, with through the weak, weak force, uh, electromagnetically. So it has to be merely charged at most. With itself, the self-interaction has those bounds, and it can interact with the weak force. So it's not that it's collisionless and dark. And, well, no, it has bounds. And you can explore those bounds. And those might seem like small changes, but those really have observational consequences and observational signatures that we can go after in galaxies, clusters. And if one day we can measure the power spectrum, not if, when we measure the power spectrum on small scales, we can actually try to see if they are there and try to see what are the, what are the properties of dark matter. So just here, a list of my, sorry. Ooh, of my prerequisites for a dark matter candidate. So whatever dark matter candidate I construct needs to follow all this. And it doesn't matter what it is. When do I have to finish? Does anyone know? I'm 40. 40, okay. And good. Some near the end also. Okay, good, good. Okay, so now that we know the properties, so we know Whatever I create for dark matter, whatever mechanism I have that I can invent and I can be very creative and you're going to see how creative we are, it has to follow those prerequisites that we just saw. So that is the model building part. But also there's some bounds on the mass. I cannot just do whatever I want. I cannot have a mass that has a mass of whatever thousands of TV as a particle, I can't. So let's explore a little bit 
about the mass, uh, the bounds on the mass of dark matter. So the mass bounds. And again, those mass bounds comes from observations. So we're going to use all the observations we have from dark matter on the large scale structure, intermediary scales and small scales, so we can try to see what is allowed and not allowed for a dark matter model. So here I'm writing the mass of dark matter. So here's mass. This is not on scale, like completely not. <laughs> so solar mass is 10 to the 66 EV. And I'm putting close to TV. So this is not on scale, OK? Uh, I'm using natural units. So until now, I've been talking about dark matter in EV. Uh, and EV, of course, is a uh, unit of energy. But in natural units, where I have C equals to H bar equals to 1, momentum, mass, and energy are all measured in EV, OK? So that's why I can talk about mass in EV. Um, right. So here is the possible mass of dark matter. Um, so we're, we're seeing here that there's some bounds on dark matter. And let's talk about them a little bit. The first bound that we have, it is thermal versus no thermal. So as we were discussing for the, uh, for the warm dark matter limit, so, or this limit on the thermal relic, if my dark matter, it is in thermal contact, so it was produced in thermal equilibrium with my photon plasma, uh, photon radiation plasma, it has to have a mass bigger than kilo electron volt. So if I have a thermally produced dark matter candidate, and I think Vera is going to talk a lot about that, it has to be bigger than kilo electron volt. Every dark matter candidate that comes here, it is still possible. I can still have dark matter that has smaller masses than that, but it has to be produced non-thermally in the universe. So it was never in thermal contact, in thermal equilibrium with the plasma, the radiation uh, barium plasma. Okay, but also it cannot be a particle everywhere. So maybe in your mind until now you're thinking about a particle. It doesn't have to be a particle. It can be a particle. So it can be that our standard model is not complete. We need an extra particle, and this particle is dark matter. And this is the bounds where it can be a particle um, here in pink. But it can be like a microscopic object, like a primordial black hole, or even composite dark matter, like an atom or a molecule or something else. And how does this particle limit come? So I'm not going to talk about this upper bound. So this upper bound here is called unitary, unitary bound. Oh, sorry, I'm going the wrong direction. So this is called unitary bound. So this is the biggest mass that dark matter can have if it's a particle. I'm not going to talk about this bound too much because it is kind of complicated, but if you have questions, come and ask me. So it's basically saying, if I wanna have thermal dark matter, more massive than this, uh, this is not allowed. So this cannot be a particle. From here on, it has to be a compositive object. It cannot be a new elementary particle. So this is the upper bound here for the particle dark matter. But also, what if it dark matter is a particle? Is it a boson or fermion? Uh, do I have any way of constraining what is the spin of dark matter from gravity? An incredible thing is that it has. So here we can see that from something like tens of hundreds of EV uh, on, it can be a fermion or a boson. But below that, it can only be a boson. And why is that the case? This is called the Tremaine gun bound. And I think Vera is going to talk more about it, but I'm just going to give a rough idea. And this is actually a bound on the spin of dark matter. And this is a bound that comes from astrophysics. So it's really cool that astrophysics can put a bound on really on the particle properties of dark matter. So since we have that, we saw Newtonian physics, normal Newtonian physics. So the mass of my galaxy, for example, or mass I can just translate into gravitational potential is going to dictate uh, what are the possible velocities that dark matter has. Right, so remember the elliptical galaxy, right? If you have less mass or more mass, the velocity is different. Uh, so whatever size of my gravitational potential, it takes the velocity. 
uh, if I combine this argument with Pauli exclusion principle, I can have a bound for how massive a fermion can be for being dark matter. And just reviewing some concepts. So a reminder of what is Pauli exclusion principle. So basically, if I have a spin uh, half or three halves, so if I have something that is half integer spin, uh, it suffers from this Pauli exclusion principle, which means that I cannot have more than one identical particle occupy the same quantum uh, state. If I have bosons, I can have many bosons occupying the same state, for example, the ground state, and I have a condensate. But fermions cannot have that. Fermions can, you can only have one per uh, state, for example. And this is the Pauli exclusion principle. So this means that fermions, they cannot, you cannot have many of them occupying the same state, for example. Another thing, and we're going to talk about phase space distribution. You heard about this this uh, week. Uh, but just to remember that this describes the occupancy number in phase space for a given particle kinetic equilibrium. Uh, so you can distinguish from fermions and bosons there because it gives you what is the occupancy number. So what we just said, fermions cannot occupy the same state, for example. Um, so the phase space is a way of computing that. So the termain gun bound says that. So if I have a fermion that dark matter, dark matter that is a fermionic component, its phase space density is going to be bounded because of this Pauli exclusion principle. So this phase space has to be smaller than the number of these spin states. Translating this, I cannot have more than one spin in one state. So my phase space is not, cannot be occupied in any way. It's bounded because of the Pauli exclusion principle. And then if I calculate the local dark matter density, and I can do that using the phase space density. So the number density is going to be the integral of F. This is also going to be bounded. So this is going to be equal to G times the maximum momentum of the dark matter particle. So just imagine that this is the upper limit of this integral. And uh, using the Vero theorem, again, the momentum in a galaxy is going to be the mass of the dark matter times the escape velocity. So the escape velocity is basically the, the maximum velocity that dark matter can have in a bound system. If it's bigger than that, it's not bound anymore. So I'm giving the maximum here velocity. Uh, and that's, uh, if I use the escape velocities of, for example, a dwarf galaxy, this gives me a bound on dark matter. So actually, uh, given the density of dark matter has a bound limit, for each mass of dark matter, I can only accept having a certain, uh, a certain density of dark matter. So for fermions, this bound is around 70, or it depends on which system you use. Lyman alpha gives you the strongest bound. I think Vera is going to talk about that. But it tells you that dark matter can only be a fermion if it has a mass bigger than something like 70 or 100 EV. So I don't know you, but I think it's amazing that with uh, Newtonian physics and observations of a galaxy, you can actually put a bound on the spin of particle dark matter. So we're not talking about a collider here, we're talking about um, really just astrophysics. So okay, so this is what we have now. So we know that dark matter uh, has to be thermal, for masses, thermally produced for masses bigger than kV, non-thermal for masses is smaller than that. So I can have dark matter with masses is smaller than kV, but it has to be non-thermally produced and it has to be a boson. Uh, it can be a fermion for this type of masses. It can only be a particle until this point, after that has to be microscopic. But what is the small, uh, the, the lower bound here? So the lower limit here, uh, comes from uh, bosons. So I can only have bosons describing dark matter. So for example, uh, bosons can have integer spin, so it can have spin zero, spin one. Uh, here I'm going to consider, for example, a spin zero field, which is just a scalar field. So this is the simplest possible dark matter candidate below kV. So let's just assume we have then this scalar field is evolving in a friedman hobson walker universe. So this is the equation of motion. H is the Hubble parameter, so this is uh, the Hubble drag term. And here I just put a potential like m square far square, right? A potential we know, very simple potential. So if I have a dark matter that behaves like that, 
dark matter is scalar dark matter that behaves like that. When this term is winning this term, so this term is dominating, this happens when H is much bigger than M. The solution of this equation is a constant. So here's the solution of this equation when H is much bigger than M. So after M becomes bigger than H, so the universe is expanding, H is going down, the Hubble parameter is going down, it's becoming smaller and smaller, then these terms dominate. And then the solution of this equation is going to be an oscillatory solution. So uh, the equation of state that corresponds to each of the solutions is the following. So if I have a constant, I have something that is low rolling here, uh, and this is going to behave with an equation of state minus one. When it's oscillating the bottom of this potential, when, which is when the mass is bigger than, is smaller than the Hubble parameter, uh, this is going to be oscillating. This is the solution. And on average, this has an equation of motion, equation of state equals zero, which we all remember is how dark matter should evolve, right? A fluid of dark matter. So basically, if I have a scalar field in my universe, it's going to have this behavior, behaving like dark energy in the beginning of the universe, in the early times, and then at late times behave like dark matter. What sets the bound for this being seen today as dark matter or dark energy is when H is equals to M. So if H is equals to M at the CMB, this is going to be behaving today like dark matter because I'm seeing the oscillations now. If this is dark energy until after the CMB, I'm basically going to be seeing this as dark energy today. So this gives a bound on the mass of this boson that it can have, this scalar field. So this scalar field needs to be bigger than the Hubble parameter at uh, equality. And this gives me a bound of uh, 10 to the minus 28. Sorry, this is not CMB, this is equality, sorry. It's so this gives me a bound, a minimal bound, uh, a lower bound for dark matter, a scalar field behaving like dark matter today. It has to have a mass bigger than 10 to the minus 28 EV, otherwise it's going to behave like dark energy here. So now you can understand what is written here, right? So if it is below 10 to the minus 28, it behaves like dark energy. If it's smaller, it behaves like dark, uh, bigger, it behaves like dark matter. But here, you don't see me writing 10 to the minus 28, you see me writing 10 to the minus 22. And I'm saying that not 100% of dark matter can be, not 100% of the scale of it can be dark matter in this region. And this comes from CMB. And we're going to talk more about this tomorrow. So from CMB and large scale structure, because of one, the suppression of the power spectrum that this type of candidate gives, plus the different evolution, uh, the dark matter is going to have if it's a scalar field instead of a CDM fluid. This puts bounds on the fraction. So this is the fraction of dark matter that it can be this scalar field. And this is the mass. And although a scalar field with tension minus 28 behaves like dark energy, it cannot be 100% of dark energy. CMB doesn't allow that. Large scale structure doesn't allow that. They really, really need CDM on those scales. So it can only be 100% of dark matter um, if it is bigger than 10 to the minus 24. So this is already a result from observations. And more than that, a uh, 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 dark matter particle that it is with such a low mass, it's actually going to behave like a wave, not like a particle. So we all remember particle wave duality. And if you don't remember tomorrow, I'm going to talk about that. So basically, all of us, everything in the universe, every particle can be described as a particle and as a wave. And the size of your wave depends on your mass and your velocity. We are, we have high mass, so our, our, our wave number, so the Bourgui wavelength that describes us is tiny. But if I have something really light, like 10 to the minus 22 EV, and again, 10 to the minus 22 EV is something like 10 to the minus 57 kilograms. This is really tiny. This is going to have a huge de Broglie wavelength. So huge that it has a size of kiloparsec. Again, parsec is a measure that we use a lot in cosmology and astrophysics because it's big, uh, it's something big. So a galaxy like ours, Milky Way, is of the size of around 200 kiloparsec. Uh, 
dark matter has is described by a wave which is of the size of kiloparsec. So it's of the size of the galaxy. Uh, so we have bounds on how big this wave can be. It cannot be much bigger than the radius of a galaxy. So if we get a really small galaxy that has a size of one kiloparsec, this means that the mass needs to be bigger than 10 to the minus 22. If it's much smaller than this, this is a huge, huge wave. And this will have huge consequences observationally. Uh, this will behave very differently and we're going to see tomorrow. Uh, so now you understand this wave dark matter bound, but also the minimum uh, bound on dark matter. And I'm almost done. Um, so does dark matter has a maximum mass that it can have? I'm not asking the particle mass, um, whatever. Can it have like whatever mass you want? 10 to the 60 solar masses? And the answer is no. So here we see the maximum mass for dark matter. So from stability against tidal disruption, so let's say I have something that has a mass like 10 solar masses, and this is my dark matter. Uh, this will be too big uh, and too massive uh, to be, for example, in a halo of a galaxy. This will disturb uh, the, the structures that we have um, in the dark matter halo. So then you have a bound here that it has to be smaller than five solar masses. So I'm almost done. So here's the complete picture of the mass bound. So here we can see how we can construct dark matter models. So first dark matter has to have all the properties we talked before, plus it has to respect those bounds. So if I want a particle dark matter, it has to be between these masses. If I want a macroscopic one, it has to be between those masses how it's produced and what is the type of particle that you can use to create, to, to, to model it. Um, and this spans 80 orders or 90 orders, depending on how, of magnitude. So we always hear all oh, dark matter, dark energy is the biggest problem in cosmology. Dark matter is pretty bad as well. It's 90 orders of magnitude. And all of those models created in all those bounds, are, those bounds are the bounds of what is possible given all the observations we have nowadays. So we either need more observations um, or we are screwed basically. Uh, just to say really quickly, we can evade those bounds a little bit, not too much, but. So given all these properties, what are the possible candidates for dark matter? Then you can imagine, okay, maybe we know a lot about dark matter. There's not a lot of possibilities. Here's the landscape of dark matter candidates. They spam all the bounds we just talked about. We can create something, we can invent a mechanism for whatever mass you want, giving all the limitations and all the properties we had. And this is the landscape. So here we can see the possible models. Let's see them a little bit closer. So you can, for example, say, oh, it's a particle. So it can be light, or it can be a neutrino, or it can interact with a weak force or it can be whatever other particle. But, okay, I don't want a particle, I don't like particles, so I want something microscopic. There's still a lot of things. Or, no, 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 no. I don't want a new particle. I'm going to modify gravity and get dark matter. So the possibilities are huge. So we not only spam 90 orders, 80, 90 orders of magnitude, but we are invoking completely different physical mechanisms from particles to black holes for waves quantum mechanical waves to explain what dark matter is. And all of those models, they are okay with all the properties we said. So probably when I was talking about the properties of mass, we're like, okay, now I have a guide to how to model, to build a new, my own model of dark matter. Yeah, and we all do because <laughs> look at this, we all have one model and it's crazy. There's a lot of models. Uh, so next lecture, we're going to explore a little bit more those models. So now that we know how dark matter behaves, now that we know what is necessary to construct a model and what are the bounds in mass and also in interactions and how cold it is, we can go and explore a few of the most famous models. Like I told you, five to 10 years ago, we would stop here basically, but now we have all of those models and they are very good candidates. So I'll start tomorrow talking a little bit about Mont. <laughs> yeah, you guys are not going to escape that. We need to talk about it. 
um, okay, thank you so much. Yeah, so we can take some questions. Yeah. Let's start with questions that were online for a while. Um, one question asks, does dark matter interact with a strong or weak force? Yeah, so we talked a little bit about it. Um, so interactions here. So what is allowed and what is not allowed? So obviously dark matter has to interact gravitationally. That's how we see it, right? Uh, we saw from the power spectrum that uh, it cannot be coupled to the photon barium plasma uh, at recombination. So this gives us a bound on how much can interact uh, uh, with the electromagnetic force. So it has to be the maximum of millicharge. So what about the strong and weak force? So the strong force could be a case, right? But the strong force, the quarks, they also carry electric charge. So they are again back to the electromagnetic bounds. So it can have strong interaction. It can, it can have into electric, uh, electromagnetic, it can, but it has to be small. We have bounds on it. It can interact with the weak force. Yes, we, it can. And the bounds are much less strict. Our steel has to be weakly, otherwise it changes the abundance of elements, but it can interact. So the answer is it can interact with everything but it has really, really strong bounds on the amount. So it has to be weakly interacting with itself, electromagnetically, strong force and weak force. One more, why does pressureless mean that dark matter oh, clusters? Okay. So, okay, so if I have a fluid, so the CDM, okay, let's go back to CDM. Uh, so CDM has a description that dark matter is described by this perfect fluid. So a perfect fluid is completely described by energy density and pressure. If I want something to behave like we know matter behaves, it has to be an equation of state zero or pressure equals to zero, right? It has to go like this. And also this is linked to how much it clusters. So if I write then the perturbation equations for, for this fluid, it's going to appear CS there. Right, and let's get the simplest case where this is constant, so it's equals to zero. So this CS is going to be equals to omega to the equation of state. So it also has to be zero. And what does it mean CS equals zero? If you all remember Jean's uh, instability. So what is Jean's instability? So Jean's instability is when we calculate uh, the solutions of the perturbation equation, right? So what is clustering is when I have a solution that is a uh, uh, clustering, exponential, uh, it's, it's, it's unstable, it's exponentially clustering. Uh, genes, uh, the genes length, it tells me what is the size where I have this unstable solution. So inside the genes radius, I have insta unstable solution, so I have clustering. Outside, I don't have clustering. So that, that's why the genes length is so important. The genes length tells us what is the scale that I have clustering or not. When CS is equal to zero, the genes length doesn't matter. It's, it's huge. So I have clustering on all scales. So that's how pressure is linked to CS that is linked to the genes length that is linked to clustering. We can talk more about this, but basically it's just perturbations of the, of the dark matter fluid. Oh. Um, yeah, so my question is, can dark matter, uh, can dark energy transform me to dark matter due to the, some fluctuation or changes of scalar field? Because uh, I so that we can describe dark energy by a scalar field yeah. and also you can say that we can describe dark matter by a scalar field. Yeah, yeah. So the question was, they asked me to repeat the question. Uh, the, the question was, can dark matter and dark energy interact? So on top of all the models I just showed you, this incredible huge landscape, dark matter can still be something else, can interact with dark energy and one be 
transform it into the other. So there are models of interacting dark matter where dark matter and dark energy couple, so they exchange energy, uh, energy momentum, and uh, sometimes momentum as well. So it depends on how you model it. So for example, you don't have to have dark matter as a scalar field for that to happen. You can have dark matter as a fermionic field that is interacting with a scalar field that describes dark energy. You can have a Lagrangian for that, or you can do many phenomenological models. So we don't have one, we have many models where dark matter interacts with dark energy. And again, we have freedom to do that because all we have is the power spectrum and observations very close to today. We know that today it needs to be very close to lambda CDN, but deviations from that before on redshifts a little bit bigger than that, they are allowed. So yes, we have models for that. This is still allowed. And actually, if I have a scalar field for dark matter that has such a small mass, you actually expect that you're going to have interactions with other like fifth forces or something else. So not only is it expected, but some people even say that it is preferred, but that stays. So you have many models um, for interacting dark matter and dark energy. So on top of that, <laughs> there's still interacting models. Yes. Oh, one more? Okay. Well, I'm, I'm free afterwards as well, so. Um, when you're using the matter power spectrum to constrain the relativistic nature of dark matter, um, what is the mechanism that facilitates the transition between the relativistic regime to the non-relativistic regime? I'm not sure if I understood the question. So we, we're saying that as long as we don't um, suppress the matter power spectrum at um, low redshifts, we're fine, but we can suppress the matter power spectrums on the scales of 10 to 20. And on small scales. Oh, yeah, so scales bigger, smaller than that, right? Yes. So K bigger than that, yeah, yeah. So then what is the mechanism that kind of that helps dark matter transition from being relativistic to non-relativistic. Um, again, I, I don't know if I understood quite well the question, because it's all a matter, and Vera, I think, is going to talk about, and how it's created, right? So, for example, if it's thermally created, the mass of this, it's going to be the same mass as the, the, the photon uh, of the plasma. Uh, it's going to have the same, I don't know, temperature or everything. So when you have your creation mechanism, you set how cold or not this, this is going to be mm -hmm. if it's thermal. It uh, to, to yeah, I think it's a little bit more complicated. Okay. Thank you, Dragon. So you he had a an early on in uh, Yeah. So my question is, um, what property does the does a particle dark matter have to have for the unitarity bound to apply? Oh, let's talk about this later. <laughs> this is complicated and very model dependent. Yeah, That's why I put order off. Yeah, because yeah. no one knows when is about that. Now. But when Pzilla is not a particle, technically, uh, consider a particle alone. And it has other ways of, like I said, there's ways of evading those bounds, right? There's ways of evading those bounds. Let's, let's yeah. take a break since I'm concerned about lunch break. Let's take a different minute break. Thank you. Thank you. Lee. Thank you. <laughs> Hi. Hi. So, when put the uh, thermal radically emit on that axis, so I assume that the 